North America enters the second year of an undeclared war between the two most powerful European powers. It had initially concentrated over the territorial dispute of the unknown lands west of the mountains, but quickly agitated older disputes in the north. Here lay the ancient narrow water passages stretching between the British colony of New York and the French colony of Quebec. This corridor included the key Lake Champlain and Lac Sacrements situated in the heart of the lands of the Mohawk people. For the war in foreign factions, there were two keys to achieving control of the Champlain region. The strategic point at the mouth of the lake dubbed Crown Point and the allegiance of the natives of the area. The French had already established themselves at the northern end of the corridor decades prior, building Fort St. Frederick at Crown Point. The French Canadians who settled around Montreal also developed strong ties with a northern tribe of Mohawk, the Kahnawaga. Many of the Kahnawaga had been converted to Catholicism by the Jesuits residing along the St. Lawrence, growing a divide among the rest of the Mohawk. Among those opposed to the conversion was Teyana Gouin, known later in history as Hendrik II, the chief of the Bear Clan believed peace was obtained for upholding allegiances between his people and the British crown. Being baptized at a young age and converted to Christianity, he walked a tightrope between two worlds. He had met many of the most important figures on all sides, including King George II in 1744, later establishing his own chapel in New York, and often found proudly wearing the English dress bestowed to him in the king's court. But his open support for the British was not as well expressed by the rest of the Iroquois Confederacy. The Six Nations made continual treaties with both France and Britain, hoping to keep peace on the lands they called home. But time had strained their neutrality, with multiple clans and tribes being pulled entirely into fighting on behalf of either the European powers. The French grew increasingly friendly to various Alokian tribes, old rivals of the Iroquois. To make matters more dire, the French began shuffling Canadian militia and Alokian warriors into the Ohio country, land claimed by the Iroquois. The Alokian, Canadian, French allegiance came to play when a Virginian expedition into western Pennsylvania was stopped in spring of 1754. Among those was the Quebec native Jacques Lagrade Saint Pierre, a career soldier in the Canadian militia that a previous governor had described as an excellent officer who will be very useful in the future, and he's equally feared and loved by the Indians. This is why the most unlikely of candidates was chosen to command the British army sent to secure Crown Point, William Johnson. Born in Ireland, he had journeyed to North America for the developing land prospects, purchasing slaves to work much of the land he bought around Albany. He soon shifted his ambitions to tapping into the lucrative trades with the Mohawk and other nations of the Iroquois, becoming fascinated and respective of the Indian cultures. By the 1740s, his home on Johnson Hill was the center of many trades and celebrations for both Iroquois and colonists. He was vital with winning the support of the Mohawk in defense of the New York frontier during the border classes with the French, his home being used as a supply basis for warriors going off to fight. At most conferences, Johnson showed solidarity by dressing in ceremonial dress often seen at Mohawk meetings. Johnson's involvement with the Mohawk went so far as being made an honorary sachem, bestowed the name Wargiana, a man who undertakes great things. By 1751, however, his troubled finances had caught up with him and forced him to resign from position as the colony's Indian commissioner. In his absence, relations quickly unraveled between the Iroquois and British. Tiana Gouin was one of many who demanded for Johnson to be reinstated. British High Command not only rehired Johnson, but appointed him to command the expedition to Crown Point. The British were hoping to exploit the friendship between Johnson and Tiana Gouin to their advantage. June 1755. Over a thousand members of the Six Nations gathered at Fort Johnson to hear Johnson's call to action. Johnson was intense in his speeches, using the visual of a fasting bundle of sticks to represent the strength and continued support of the British. But joining the British in battle would most likely mean fighting the Kahnawaga. Mohawks fighting Mohawks. Compounding the matter was the presence of a German by the name of John Lydius. The Iroquois had much disdain for the shady merchant who was selling off land in eastern Pennsylvania claimed by the Six Nations. He added confusion to the meeting as he tried to sway several in the crowd to join the campaign of Governor Shirley, not Johnson. 
The chain of command for the British was a bit confusing. Commander of North America, Edward Braddock, had made his second command William Shirley, but appointed Johnson in charge of Indian affairs. Neither man could truly outweigh the other, and Braddock would never have the chance to clarify the structure. Shirley was more focused on raising an army to campaign against Oswego, using Lydias to win over Iroquois support. Teana Guin announced his complete loyalty to Johnson, hoping to sway the power in favor of his friend. The conference stretched on for days. As Johnson debated in New York, his equal stepped off a boat in Quebec. Jean Armand Descal came to the New World backed by a career in armed services spanning over 30 years. Although born in Saxony, he became one of the finest in the French army after being the Comte A to their best general, Marcel de Sac. Descal had been most impressed by Sack's use of partisan fighters in the War of Austrian Succession, and quickly hoped to do the same with the militia and native allies of North America. Along with him came four battalions of regulars straight from the mainland. But he was dealing with always changing plans. His boat arrived too late to reach the Ohio country by summer, now being tasked on using his regulars to defend Montreal. That too quickly changed when word reached the French of a planned strike against Niagara. But the warnings were far quicker than the actual threat. Shirley and Johnson were both marred with recruiting and supplying for their respective expeditions. All Shirley had achieved in interfering at Fort Johnson was dissuading many Iroquoian volunteers. Just over 200 Mohawks agreed to join the British. With no regular soldiers at his disposal, Johnson's army would have to be pulled together from militias in the surrounding colonies. Men from the ages of 18 to 35 were recruited out of New York, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. Most were farmers, some unfortunate to be conscripted into service. Some had prior experience in militias, but very few knew the codes and drills the British expected from their armies. Their collected commander was Provincial Major General Phineas Lyman of Connecticut. The only regular officer in camp at Albany was Lieutenant Colonel William Irie, detached from the 44th foot, originally sent to be an engineer for Johnson. He soon found himself doing three times the amount of work. Not only was he chief engineer, he was also appointed the quartermaster general and the chief of artillery. Iria oversaw the ill-mannered provincial's construction over some 150 bateaux, which on July 22nd carried the artillery and supplies of some 1,200 provincials under Lyman's command up the Hudson River, while the men cleared a military road running parallel to the river. On August 3rd, they arrived at a bend in the river known by the Mohawks as the Great Carrion Place. Ira quickly formulated plans for the provincials to make reality, a stockade to secure the region that became known as Fort Lineman. News now reached both Johnson and Descalf cataclysmic events in the Ohio country. Braddock's expedition had been soundly defeated by a smaller French and native force. With these coveted lands secured for the summer, France could now shift resources to the developing threat to the Champlain Corridor. French-aligned Conewaga scouts gave reports of a British force within a two-day's march of Crown Point. Alarmed, High Command immediately diverted these scouts to Fort St. Frederick, being joined by his second command, Lieutenant Colonel Pierre-André Cohen, Comte de Montreal. Montreal would arrive in late August with the rest of the regulars from the regiments de la Reine and de la Droite. Several hundred Canadian militia commanded by St. Pierre quickly moved toward Crown Point, as well as hundreds of warriors from the Abenaki Nation and Kahnawaga tribe. The warnings, however, were greatly miscalculated. It would not be until the 14th of August that Johnson arrived with the rear guard at Fort Lineman. The initial plan was to cut a road northeast to Wood Creek, feeding directly into Lake Champlain. But the creek and bay which it fed into were running dry this year, and the mountains made it far too difficult to attempt and haul the 20 cannon brought on campaign overland. Johnson opted instead to cut a new road to launch the bateau in the smaller Lac du saint Sacrement, arriving there on the 28th. The stamp of the king was quickly placed on the land by Johnson renaming the waters Lake George. The provincials quickly shifted from clearing the road to clearing the thick timber to make way for an encampment. Johnson decided to move the bulk of his 1,500-man force to the new camp, leaving 500 to continue the construction of Fort Lyman. Taking Lake George would require the British to also secure the junction between the two lakes at Ticonderoga. These scouts made sure to snatch the junction away. The first French troops arrived at the point on September 2nd. 
Although not particularly aware of the looming threat, Johnson wished for his force to build a good, defensible fort that might stand against enemy artillery. His officers objected, seeing how exhausted the army already was from hauling the artillery through the woods. The work had been so dreadful that many of the wagoneers had deserted by this time. Nevertheless, Johnson ordered for a stockade big enough to hold a hundred men to be established at the lake. D. Scout had a gr far greater picture of his enemy's displacement. St. Pierre's native scouts were priming him for changes by the hour. Hearing word that just a small force was located at Fort Lyman, he saw an opportunity to strike. He picked the most elite of his regulars, the Grenadiers, along with two dozen additional colonial men from the Compagnes Franches. St. Pierre took charge of over 600 Indians, with another 700 Canadian militia attached to the strike force. They moved swiftly by boat, setting off from Ticonderoga on the morning of September 5th. They reached the South Bay and Woods Creek by late afternoon, leaving their boats behind. After two days of trampling through the thickest foliage New York could offer, these scow scouts were within sight of Fort Lyman. They reported seeing an incomplete stockade, with the entire garrison encamped outside its walls. D. Scout wished to attack immediately, but the Kahnawaga feared attacking an encampment that may include their own Mohawk relatives. D. Scout would later report that Kahnawaga misled them to the wrong road and began to doubt the sincerity of his native allies. The assault was aborted. The French and natives made camp three miles north of Fort Lyman, just off Johnson's wagon road. The delay quickly had great consequence. A party of Mohawks had located the paths taken by the French and informed Johnson by nightfall. Johnson hurriedly scribbled a warning to Colonel Blanchard, the commanding officer at Fort Lyman, of an impending attack. A wagon driver by the name of Jacob Adams volunteered to ride alone to deliver the warning. At around 11 p.m., Adams was within three miles of Fort Lyman by way of the wagon road when a lone shot rang out. On the morning of September 8th, neither Johnson nor Blanchard knew the actions of the other. D. Scow examined the intercepted warning as the sun began to rise and altered his plans. Based upon the message, D. Scow estimated that the party at Lake George was similar in size to the one at Fort Lyman. Instead of attacking Blanchard, D. Scow would instead strike Johnson. As dawn rose over Lake George, the officers of the British Army gathered at the general's tent for a council of war. Johnson decided to put two detachments, number 500 men each, one to reinforce Blanchard's garrison and a second to capture the French boats in the South Bay. But Teonaguin questioned the logic of throwing such a large party into the dense New York woods. He instead urged Johnson to combine the parties into one column to relieve Fort Lyman. Johnson heeded his friend's advice. Around 8 a.m., Several hundred men under the command of Colonel Ephraim Williams Jr. marched out of camp. Williams was a well-respected provincial officer who had traveled the world and took up a multitude of professions. He was apt to take in the, up the task of leading men through the treacherous forest. The column consisted of Williams' own 3rd Massachusetts Regiment, made up of companies such as the newly formed Rogers Rangers. The rear was covered by the 2nd Connecticut, commanded by Lt. Colonel Nathan Whitting. But the provincials were outpaced by Tiana Gouin's 250 Mohawks covering the head of the march. Williams called a halt to the march just over a mile out of camp, reorganized around a tranquil pond next to the road. Sometime before 10, French allied native scouts caught sight of Williams' column resuming their march from the pond. They were able to get so close due to the fact that the Massachusetts colonel felt it was unnecessary to deploy skirmishers in the ravine. The scouts reported back to D. Scout, who was leading his allied column quickly up the recently cut wagon road. In later reports, D. Scout described his reaction to the intelligence. I ordered the Indians to throw themselves into the woods to allow the enemy to pass so as to attack them in the rear whilst the Canadians took them in the flank and I should wait for them in the front with the regular troops. At 10.30 a.m., Tiana Gouin entered the ravine. To his right, the trees rose sharply up a steep slope, crested by a rocky ledge. To his left, the land briefly gullied into a small stream before jutting back into the mountains. D. Scout would later report, and what he claimed, the moment of treachery, that their cover was seemingly blown when a Kahnawagan warrior stepped out of the brush to try and keep Tiana Gouin and his Mohawk brethren from advancing into the trap. Tiana Gouin dismissed the warning, and shortly thereafter a shot was fired. Within seconds, a horseshoe of gunfire erupted around the column. 
Tiana Goon's horse was shot from under him. A Kanawagan warrior stabs the Mohawk chief in the back, killing and scalping him in the wagon road. Mohawk and Massachusetts gunfire shoots astray into the forest, desperately trying to hit anything. St. Pierre, guiding French allied warriors into battle, is hit with the first volley and killed immediately. Over 30 Mohawk warriors are dead, their small body melting into the Massachusetts men. Williams jumps upon a rock, trying to direct the regiment off the road and toward the rocky shelf. A ball passes through his skull. The colonel drops to the rock dead. With the force imploding around them, several Massachusetts men pull their fallen commander's body under the cover of several trees to avoid desecration. Seth Pomeroy, a gunsmith from Northampton, took charge of the dissolving regiment. The surviving Mohawks and Massachusetts men rushed up the wagon road as the French regulars gave chase. Wedding's Connecticut regiment had been the only one spared from the bloody opening moments and had time to take to every stone and bush west and east of the roadway. Wedding managed to stunt the French advance, performing a series of delaying actions for the three miles back to the lake. Having heard the crackling of muskets in the distance, Johnson dispatched a few hundred men from Edward Cole's 1st Rhode Island Regiment to find the site of battle. The Rhode Island soldiers merge into Whitting's defense, managing to bottle up these cows' party long enough to buy time for everyone to retreat and reorganize back at camp. When the fighting began, Johnson hurriedly put the entirety of his camp into action. Besides deploying Cole's regiment, he ordered for whatever could be used to form a barricade around the camp. Fallen logs and limbs were pulled together, dirt was tossed into mounds, and wagons were rolled to their sides. The Massachusetts men formed up on the western side of the camp, with the smaller detachment from New York secure in the eastern flank. The Connecticut regiments reorganized to straddle the wagon road leading into camp. The roadway itself was left open, as I Ray oversaw three pieces of artillery being deployed within the roadway. An 18 or 32 pounder was also hauled up on a rise behind the eastern flank. Shortly after 12, the last of the survivors reached camp. The stragglers either joined their respective colonies ranks or formed ad hoc units to guard the rear from being surrounded. It was not a moment too soon that the barricades were finished that the banners of the Grenadiers could be seen fluttering up the road. These cows forced to halt after seemingly successful ambush, as many of the Kahnawaga were no longer willing to shed Mohawk blood. Coupled with the loss of St. Pierre, there was nobody left to keep the interests of the various tribes from clashing. These cows resumed undaunted with hundreds of volunteers willing to advance, but the quarrel had lost him the element of surprise. Phineas Lyman later described these cows' advance. Their arms glistened like the sun, and with their bayonets fixed and as confident as I suppose of them coming straight into our camp and carrying all before them as ever an army was. The Grenadiers charged like a sledgehammer toward the wall, hoping the Green Provincials would break in panic. But Johnson stood close with sword in hand, giving the order at the last possible second to fire. At 80 yards, the Grenadiers fired the first volley, but their fatigue had put them just out of range. Fear struck the Grenadiers. Their step quickened to close the gap, but it was too late. The cannon tore lanes, streets, and alleys through the ranks, Ira would later recall. These cow wished for the warriors to pour into the open, but they were unwilling to challenge the artillery. They instead followed the Canadians and fanning out through the woods. Their fire had great effect, for within minutes of the battle starting, Johnson took a bullet to his rear. Lyman took command, trying to keep order amongst the lines, hoping to conserve as much ammunition as possible. But for many, experiencing under, being under fire for the first time, they took to pinning themselves under the barricades and waiting for the ordeal to be over. As the Canadians and natives continued fanning out, their fire became less accurate. At an aid station at camp, Thomas Williams, brother of the deceased Massachusetts colonel, would later report, The French bullets blew like hailstones around my ears, but received no hurt any more than the bark of trees and chips flying in our faces. Unable to get on the flank of the New Yorkers due to swampy grounds, the attack instead swung toward the west. Abenaki warriors took to a partially cleared hill within a few dozen yards from the 2nd Massachusetts. Their colonel, Moses Titcom, jumped over the breastworks along with a lieutenant, hoping to lead a counterattack toward the hill. Both were killed within seconds of entering no man's land. The regulars began themselves moving into the trees on the western end, as everyone was gradually shifting toward the left side of the field. 
Ira Syed, a 32 pounder that mowed down the French flanks, stunning this advance. It was now past two o'clock. The French attacks were continually being stonewalled. D Scout and Montreal were close to the British line, trying to gather their remaining numbers for a concentrated strike upon the flank. Realizing the militia and warriors were beginning to pull back from the fight, D Scout personally led another charge out of the woods. His recklessness finally caught the better of him as a musket ball tore through his leg. Montreal raced to help his injured general, but he himself was grazing the arm. A second bullet shattered D Scout's knee before Montreal and a party of Canadians attempted to pull him from the field, but a skilled Connecticut marksman took out one of the rescue party. A third bullet cracked the general's opposite leg. Montreal's cartouche box spared him of a severe wound to the hip. As provincials began to pour over the barricade, D Scout ordered Montreal to leave the surviving army in retreat. Hesitant to leave his commanding officer bleeding on the field, Montreal had no choice but to heed these instructions. After nearly three hours, the remaining French troops and their allies departed back down the wagon road. While the two armies battled it out along the shores of Lake George, hundreds of warriors and Canadians unwilling to fight had resigned themselves to rest along the large pond used earlier by William's column. Wounded Frenchmen began to peter into this unorganized body, giving accounts of the brutal fighting up ahead. But unbeknownst to them, a body of British provincials were moving toward them. At dawn, a party of 60 men from New Hampshire were sent out from Fort Lineman to search for the source of gunfire. They found Jacob Adams' body scalped amongst several burning wagons. When the booming of artillery rolled over the mountain, Blanchard called a council of war. It was agreed to dispatch that are 60 New Hampshire provincials with 90 New Yorkers to investigate the whereabouts of the French army. The party's leaders, William McGinnis and Nathaniel Folsom, quickly disregarded the orders as they drew closer to the sounds of battle. As Folsom put it, I was not afraid of being blamed by our superior officers for helping our friends in distress. Somewhere between 4 and 5 o'clock, they came across a few skirmishers protecting the approach to the pond from the south. Folsom led the New Hampshire men over a small hill and poured into the disheveled French ranks. The New Yorkers took up more concrete positions around the pond, firing at anyone who moved. Pockets of resistance from the Canadian militia and their native allies managed to gravely wound several of the attackers, including a mortal wound to McGinnis's head. Folsom fell wounded as well but managed to rally the British party and charge into the rim of the pond. Having no more stomach for fighting, the warriors and militia fled into the relative safety of the surrounding forest. The stragglers merged into the retreating French column, now led by Montreal. Montreal continued south, while Folsom moved north to the encampment. Along the way, Folsom's men found the bodies of many of the victims of the bloody morning scout, many having their scalps removed. Several more accounts tell of corpses being tied to trees, with every possession having been stripped away. The New Hampshire and New Yorkers spent the evening gather up as many French and native dead, returning the favor of grisly treatment of the deceased. These bodies would be tossed into the pond, with legends saying there were so many corpses that one could walk clear across without getting wet. From then on, the small pool of water became known as Bloody Pond the site of the last action in the Battle of Lake George. The sun at last began to set on Lake George. The once raw recruits of the British Army now staggered through the motions of collecting useful provisions from the dead and finding proper burial locations. A party would come across the badly wounded Diskow, who by now had received a fourth wound to the groin. Want to, to avenge the death of so many of their Mohawk brethren, Iroquois warriors tried to rustle Diskow from the provincial's care. Only the personal interference of Johnson spared the French general's life. Johnson gave orders for the surgeon to treat Diskow with the best of care, although most medical officials doubted the chances of a full recovery. To the Mohawk, the image of Johnson shielding Diskow was the last straw. They scalped as many of the dead, took with them as many trophies to gain some sort of achievement from the engagement, and quickly departed back to their homes. 
In the eight hours of fighting, the official French journal claims nearly 150 of the French ranks were dead, with over 160 being wounded and approximately 30 were captured, including their commanding officer. Though it is believed the journal greatly downplays the losses amongst the native ranks. The British had paid a similar price, with Johnson reported 154 of his rank being dead, over 100 wounded, and nearly 70 missing. Most of those missing would later turn up deceased. The British would eventually lose 18 commissioned officers because of this fight. At least half of the casualties were accumulated in the Bloody Morning Scout, with the 3rd Massachusetts recorded over 70 of their number being marks on the total butcher's bill. But no group suffered more greatly than the Mohawks. For their allegiance to the British, they had lost over 60 warriors in a fight that was to determine European dominance over their homeland. It's unclear how many of their Conawagan brethren had fallen in the French ranks. September 8, 1755 still is remembered as one of the darkest days in Mohawk history. To those who would only hear of the Battle of Lake George through the paper, it appeared to be a great British victory to counter the devastating loss of Braddock's expedition. Governor Shirley urged for Johnson to continue his advance to Crown Point. Johnson, however, was still sitting in a devastated camp with far fewer than he had set off with. With the Mohawk gone and much of the provincial enlistments expiring, he saw no way he could realistically continue north. The French had retreated back to Ticonderoga, fortifying their claims with a defense that became known as Carleon. Johnson would follow suit, pushing his remaining soldiers to their very limits to construct a formidable defense on a hill overlooking Lake George. On November 3, 1755, the stockade was officially christened Fort William Henry. Both sides would continue to toil over control of the Champlain Corridor, with many more bloody battles awaiting in the coming years. Controversy would mar Johnson in the months following the battle. He made no mention of the leadership roles Lyman and Winning had involved with in the success of the battle. The unwillingness to advance didn't help the matter. But the French had failed to stop the British encroachment toward Crown Point. They also had to face the reality of having to recruit yet another French commander, delaying large-scale campaigns for considerable time. Time used by the colonies to fortify the frontier and boost their armed numbers. Johnson's success on the shores of Lake George would be one of only a few British victories in the first years of what would become a world war, but one crucial in proving the abilities of the often overlooked colonial troops in America. The Battle of Lake George demonstrated the importance of allegiances between European powers, their colonial subjects, and native allies.